Hi guys and welcome to Manch Talk. I'm Carla Garrick. I have a guest with me today who I will introduce in a hot second, but welcome to the show. Uh, Miss Tammy is very lucky to be in Florida. She keeps post posting these like gorgeous beach shots and margarita glasses and awesome seafood. So I can't lie, a little jealous, but you know, I decided, well, you know, while the, what do they say when the cat's out, let the mice play? Yeah, when the cat's away. <laughs> when the cat's away, let the mice play. So we're the mice. I am delighted to welcome Lori Ortolano to the show. Uh, anyone who's been watching Manch Talk for a while knows that uh, I talk about her case and the, the incredible work she's been doing in Nashua to try and keep our government open and responsive and, of course, accountable to the people. So Lori uh, has been doing a lot of the right to know work in Nashua and what I thought would be really useful for our viewers back home is to just kind of unpack it a little bit. You know, I hear dramatic parts of the story and then, you know, I kind of lead with that. But I think it'll be helpful for folks if we just kind of take a step back and we start with who's Lori and how did this all initially start? It started when my husband and I bought a house in Nashua seven years ago. Uh, the very end of December 2013, we purchased a home. And um, we moved in a couple of weeks into the house. We had an assessor mail a letter to us and let us know that the assessment had been increased around $240,000, which was huge. Wow. So the tax <laughs> bill went up 50%. It was a, like a $5,000 increase seemed wrong. I had done all this research before I bought the house, make certain everything was in order. They had just done an update. Uh, assessor came out and said, nope, you know what? This is, this is the way it is. This is what it belongs at. You bought it for a certain price and it was priced lower. So we moved it up to the sale price. Uh -huh. Actually, that's an illegal move that I didn't know about until we went through this reevaluation in 2018 and the city did. And it was pointed out by the contractor that came to Nashua to do the update that the house had been sales chased. So that is a term, it's a technical term that I actually heard the first time when I started listening and learning more about your case. So correct me if I'm wrong, but sales chasing is basically when the assessors let's be charitable, are too lazy to actually do their job. Yeah, <laughs> That's me being charitable. Yes. So, <laughs> and, yep. then, um, and then just basically look at the Zillow price or whatever the sales price was, and then they put it up. They, and yep. typically they do that. What's supposed to happen is that they do it every year or every two years. They kind of look at a neighborhood and they say, okay, we're going to go in and we're going to assess the entire neighborhood. Right. But we're not going to, I don't know, single out one person and say, why don't we put your property taxes up 50%? That's what happened. And I never heard the term, but it was the president of KRT, a gentleman named Ken Rogers. We went to a hearing and he identified, he looked at our card and he was like, this isn't right. And he said, tell me what happened when you bought the house. And as soon as we explained it to him, he said, well, you were sales chase, the same thing happened to me. Oh, wow. Now, as soon as he gave us that term, that night my husband and I went home and researched it. And we discovered, you know, what it was. And we said, well, this, wasn't a, this was not cool. As soon as I addressed it with the city, though, everyone, you know, turtled in. Mm -hmm. Heads went into the shell. Nobody was responsible. The guy never said it. Everyone wanted protection. Yep. And we pretended like it just didn't happen. Wow. And so they have never acknowledged that that happened to the property. Oh. But, you know, that's the way. Say it isn't so. Say it isn't <laughs> so, exactly. And then what was so ironic is when that happened that year in January of 2014 and the assessor came to the house, I pointed out, I was totally new in the neighborhood. The neighbor right next to me had done this massive addition on their home. A thousand square feet. It was a $400,000 permit. Wow. This was a very nice house. And it was a thousand square feet bigger than mine updated. Our house was original 1925 construction with all original features. So our home was restored, mm -hmm. but not really renovated. Gotcha. Okay. So this house was renovated at a very high level and beautiful, beautifully done. The assessment on that house was 525, was 200,000 less than mine. So I had said to the assessor, I don't even understand this. How, how can I possibly be at this level and look at the neighbor's house? And he went, oh, well, I never, I never caught that. <gasps> Two months later, he raised his over 200,000. Oh, no. Of course, 
That's so, <laughs> so he hit the neighbor right next to me. Never looked at anyone else's. Oh, wow. So the neighbor next to me, my husband's like, run for cover. Right? You know, don't right? even say hello. But actually, he was super, they were super cool about it. But he actually thought for four years that they had reevaluated the whole neighborhood. Oh, wow. They had gone and done it to everyone else. And they hadn't. They had just targeted us. So once the new numbers came out in 2018 and my husband and I saw what the assessments were on our street, we were floored. I mean, we had overpaid like $30,000 in wow. five years. And so that's opened up the whole thing to start investigating. And as I started investigating, there was just, you know, one door led to another. <laughs> and I, I can't even anticipate what I really walked into. I didn't know it, but I knew it was wrong. Right. And I know I'm somebody who has a lot of conviction when something isn't right mm -hmm. to say, wait a minute. Right. I, I'm not. And I cannot stand when I feel like people are lying to me. I know. That fundamentally upsets me so much. And the thing is, you know, oftentimes, I, I, you know, I, I love to see when we awaken activists where it's literally by default. Right. It's on accident. It's by accident because someone went, this is weird. What's going on here? And then you use the words, you know, you kind of start to, you know, you peel away at peel it. Peel away at it. And you see that, wow, okay, so this issue leads to this issue leads to this issue. Yep. So initially, you, if I remember correctly, hired a PI, right? Yes, I did. <laughs> I was so, I started noticing um, that there were a lot of irregularities, and one assessor was concerning me a lot. He, there was just no justification for the changes he was making in properties. And a woman who worked in the office had said to me that she felt he was filing illegal mileage logs and illegally recording his stuff. So when she first keyed me onto this, I went and pulled out of the financial office all of these um, reimbursements and work logs that were submitted. But I didn't know what to do with them exactly. I could see the irregularities, but proving it is entirely Hard. different. Yes. And I felt like I just needed to focus on the assessing work. And if I could key off that he wasn't actually getting the work done, that that would tie into those logs. So I spent months looking at properties and realizing justifications were just missing. So um, I was so concerned by April. Um, what happened is the mayor. They fired the chief who was working in Nashua March 1st. Okay. They did a restructure and they got rid of him. And, and I was, that's the chief assessor? Yes. Okay. The chief of assessing for Nashua was let go. Okay. I was, and they wrote a report saying, you know what? Nashua doesn't need a chief at all. We're not even going to have one. Okay. Well, I was super concerned. I remember being in a restaurant downtown Nashua, bought my lunch, reading the report, I had to get up and throw my lunch away. I was so like <laughs> sickened by the thought that a city the size of Nashua was going to run an assessing office without a manager, a qualified manager. What I had understood at the time researching is there's a lot of technical work in assessing. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of state regulations. You have to know your stuff. You can't see to the pants this. And it's everyone's property assessments. These are we're, we're, we're a high stakes state. Right. We put it all on these assessments. Yep. So getting them right is super important. Yes. And um, so I, the mayor announced in a public meeting, an alderman meeting, that he was going to take this guy who was so concerning to me and make him the next supervisor. Ooh. And that's when I, I almost fell on the floor. Yeah. I was like, oh my gosh, <laughs> this cannot be. Let's make the problem worse. Oh, it was. <laughs> It was startling. And it's at that point I was like, I got to hire a PI. So between March and April 1st, I found a guy nice. who had nice credentials, um, had been with a, um, an office, a state office for investigation for like 12 years and went off on his own. Hired him. He goes out, does 30 days of surveillance for me. And we discover the guy is signing out on the whiteboard saying, I'm, I'm inspecting properties when he's sleeping in parking lots. Right. And he had had some history of issues with using the city computers for pornography. Oh, goodness. And they had <laughs> let that go. Two occasions he was caught, and they let it go. You know, and, and uh, just to interrupt for a second, that's partly why right to know to me is so important, right? We have seen audits come out of police departments that are suppressed and hidden from the public. This kind of assessor tax abatement, tax work, right? And so part of my passion is 
I always say you can't fix a problem if you don't know what the problem is. Exactly. And you can't identify a problem unless you know what is going on, right? Like we don't just want to, I mean, I do it sometimes, I admit it. Uh, you know, you are just like, this is wrong because I can't tell. But you know, as you say, we need that proof and we need that evidence. So when they're doing reports and they're looking at bad employees and they're suppressing that information. I mean, we've seen teachers that are sexually assaulting people where there are reports, there are complaints. Everyone's done the right thing, except because it's not public we don't have the public oversight to say, you know what? No, we actually want that guy fired. Right. So Lori got so that guy fired. No, they, <laughs> oh, they didn't. They wouldn't fire him. Oh. So the biggest, so I had all of this investigative work. I had the full report. I had plenty of instances. The mayor and the director who took over as the chief of assessing, the woman who really wasn't qualified, uh, refused to act on him. And um, they claimed that the report was too weak, um, and they hired their own private. They hired their own investigator, mm -hmm. who was an attorney, mm -hmm. to look at these charges, because it was an attorney hired by the city. Um, when he was, the report was done. They claimed it was attorney-client privilege and couldn't be released. Right. Yes. So there we go. It's locked up, and we can't get a mm -hmm. determination from the our tax dollars used to come up with the city thing. And they fought tooth and nail to keep this guy in. And that was pretty amazing to me. Actually, that is my moment of, okay, now I know what I'm up against. Mm -hmm. And it really feels far more like a criminal system mm -hmm. than a well-run system when that happens. You know, it's kind of not what I like to see at all. And we're now strapped with this individual, I'm going to guess, for 12 or 15 years. Oh, wow. So I I was under the impression that that person went to Hooksit. Who was the person? That was the chief that they so got the, rid of. Oh. The chief ended up getting a job after like six months in Hooksit. And the guy who they were going to promote, who was sleeping in the parking lots, got a pass. Wow. So he's down there. So I kept doing my work. I kept, um, I started filing what we call PA-71s, which are formal complaints with the Department of Revenue. And they have a means by which you can file a complaint. It's exhausting. You know a lot of these <laughs> things. It's it's almost like it's designed to make it hard oh, for the person to the try average and person keep them Oh my gosh. <laughs> I can't even tell you how tough it is to do this. And I put it together. I delivered this voluminous book up to the state with complaints against three assessors. I don't think they had ever seen a complaint like that. And then it opened the door for me to file more as I was catching things. But, and the DRA was pretty effective. It took a long time, they had to investigate them. But they did investigate and they leveled sanctions. And that assessor that I wanted, that was sleeping on the job, they sanctioned him and removed his certification as a supervisor oh, wow. for 12 okay. months. I believe it was 12 months. He might be coming out of it now. I wish they could have done it for longer. Right. There were more complaints. But um, their hands are tied, too, by what they can do. Turns out the state, the DRA complaint form only allows you to grab um, issues that are six months old or mm. newer. Oh. Six months is too short. Well, you know, the, the, of course, all the rules are unbalanced, right? So one of the complaints I generally have with the way things work is that we don't have any sanctions against any government actions, right? So that's no. one of the things with the right to know law. Uh, which is RSA 91A for folks back home, uh, you know, it says they're supposed to do this and they're supposed to let you know within five days, they're supposed to give you the information and all of that. And of course they don't. I mean, they'll often now they'll respond and they'll be like, well, we're going to get back to you in, in 30 days. And the law clearly says five days, but because the law doesn't have any sanctions that say, if you don't do this, you're going to get attorney's fees or you're going to get, you know, fired or, you know, someone's going to, I don't know, pull out your fingernails. That's... I'm not advocating for violence, but you know, even just maybe, I don't know, following the law doesn't seem like it should be an unreasonable request from a citizen. It is, and, and it's also what I found. Um, so the DRA was working along and doing some effective things, and then uh, 
the Board of Tax and Land Appeal got a, got involved and called a hearing unknown to me. Oh. Um, they were reading newspaper articles and they called the city up to address it. They wrote an order mandating that the city had to do another um, reevaluation and, and do it as a list and measure, do a more complete reevaluation, okay. which hadn't been done in Nashua in 30 years. That's oh. a long time. <laughs> so they got involved. Um, but they're the most challenging agency to work with out of them, I think because, and I'm starting to realize it more, they're really more like a quasi-court. Mm. So if you go in, there's no complaint form to go to them with, not okay. like the DRA. It's, and I'm starting to realize now, if you bring an issue to them, you really have to present it as a lawsuit. Okay. And um, it's and not, the them is who again? The so. Board of Tax and Land Appeal, okay. the actual board. Yep. And it's not, it's re really confusing for a citizen to understand that. It just is. And citizens aren't comfortable bringing a lawsuit because we don't know how to do it. Right. Right. So, I and mean, then I'm of learning. Course, I'm sure in your case, um, you, you must be up there in terms of attorney fees. Oh, my this gosh. I, it, this it's, My right to know lawsuit is going to be about 200000 That is. And it's insane. And crazy. You know, and the other thing is when I wanted help with the right to know, when it started, I couldn't find a lawyer to help me. Mm -hmm. All the local lawyers are doing business with the city of Nashua. Yep. And they all said, And they all conflict oh, out, conflict, right? conflict. Mm -hmm. Then I started calling into, you know, Concord and the Seacoast. And then I found um, Rick Lehman. And I found Rick because he had helped a gentleman in Nashua who had been thrown out of a public building illegally and given a... Uh, uh, a, a restraining order or something, right. you know, not to come back, a, a criminal, no trespass order. So Rick had gotten involved with that and his name was in the paper. Okay. So I called him up and at the time, the woman in the assessing office who was essentially the whistleblower, yep. she was kind of 20 plus years there and had had it with what she was seeing. <laughs> she was winding down on her career and yep. she decided to be a risk taker, Good I would say. Her. Yeah. Good for her. She's we a, need more of oh that. Oh my gosh. And she should have been protected. She should have filed whistleblower protection and uh -oh. she didn't. Although I will tell you, I'm not holding my breath in New Hampshire for those kinds of protections either. I would say over the you know 12 13 years i've been here and following these things we do have those brave people who come forward and and they just they get ramrodded oh you know she the, was, the, she the, was the veterans affairs people people like this you know we've had other whistleblowers i keep encouraging someone has the full unredacted Lori's list. Why has that not been leaked? If you all claim you don't like the bad cops and we don't like Get the bad apples, well, someone could leak the list. I'm just saying, <laughs> right? So it's true. Yeah. So, so she was like a brave soul and she put herself out there and she challenged the system. She was also very good about right to know. Mm -hmm. She was, forthcoming with records in an assessing office the way an office is supposed to run. Now, d is it correct that someone actually said to you that they regard right to no requests as a hostile act? Yes. All right, tell us about that. Yes, <laughs> that was um, that was one of the elected officials in Nashua who said when you file a right to no, uh, it's considered an act of hostility. And I had been on a school board in Nashua and I mean in um, Litchfield in my 30s and on the budget committee for seven, eight years, I did public service elected. Mm -hmm. I never as an elected official considered a right to know in an act of aggression or a hostile act, no. ever. I felt like it was truly a citizen's right, except that they're looking for information, give them what they're looking for and be cooperative, right. period. Yep. Don't label them, don't do anything. I have always believed that, so when I, came to Nashua and I filed a formal right to know, which I didn't do initially. Uh -huh. um, it was actually the DRA that said to me, you're going to have to invoke the formal right to know law oh, wow. because they could see I was being stonewalled. Yep. So it was actually the DRA up there that said, invoke it. Okay. So I had totally kind of forgotten about 91A in my right. school board days and stuff. It had been a long yep. time. Yep. I hadn't been stirred into an issue. Then all of a sudden the lights came on and I was like, this is where I have to go. Okay. So, um, and I didn't consider myself being hostile at all. at all. I was being direct. I was being more defined. I was being careful. I was being, doc I was documenting now. These were all good things. Yep. And they had an obligation to get me the information. And it was assessing for crying out loud. Right. And I these mean, are public records. Totally. So I noticed we only have 10 minutes left and I have some specific questions I want for you. I do want people 
I want people to know what happened to you on that. I think it was a Saturday or a Sunday when the doorbell rang. Because I always talk about when the police showed up at your house. Can you, that happened, right? Yes. So it was, so there were two occasions. Are you talking about well, first? Oh, I got, well, tell me about both. <laughs> the first time they came was in the fall of 2019. Okay. When the police were actually investigating this assessor for possible embezzlement and work fraud. Oh, wow. They showed up at the door. My husband answered. I wasn't there. And they were serving me with a warning for a restraining order to have no contact with anyone outside of the assessing office. And it was all people in the assessing office, including this director who had issued this order. So they filed a restraining order against a oh. member of the public who was filing right to know requests. Because I had gone to the police and asked for help. And it was, it was a warning for a restraining order. Okay, and, that okay. sounds legally. And you know what? You know what's interesting is they can do this without anything in writing. So yeah, so it was a verbal warning. You I know was what shocked. we used to call that? You know, when ding dong and someone shows up and they're like, "I'm just here to let you know, like right. you know, do what we want, or someone's going to get hurt." Right, 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 right. And so it came out of nowhere. I was stunned and I was upset. Of course, I was really upset. Yep. I was like, "How did they, you know?" the police are supposed to be investigating what's going on in the assessing office and I'm under investigation. Yep. And what happened is the investigation became an investigation of me and the lady in the office who was the whistleblower. Totally turned on us. Wow. And uh, I regret doing it because it just was not a fair or, the police are supposed to be a separate entity run by a commission in Nashua because of past corruption issues. Mm. And instead of operating like an independent entity, they operated like you know, um, uh, uh, the, the right the, uh, arm, the, the long arm of the mayor. Yep, the arm of the state. They the did. armed arm of the state. So, and when I put in for a right to know to get the documents on this restraining, this warning, and they sent them to me, which they took like five months to give them to me. They come after in January. So it's a September issue. I get the documentation in January. The report states that somebody in City Hall contacted the police department to say all the assessing staff wanted a warning given to Miss Ortolano. Wow. They didn't document who it was. That's ridiculous. Now the police always document. So it makes me think that it was possibly one of the people being investigated, which how retaliatory is that? Very. <laughs> or it's the mayor himself or yep. somebody else who made, if they had called on the police line, it would have been recorded. Right. They had a private phone number yep. to call or the officer just said, let me go scare her for right, you. Let me right. put, let me kick her back on her heels. So that was the first time. And then the, the second, second time, time was just more recently. I went to City Hall to try and get these abatement applications stamped and for so senior citizens. And so you're actually helping yes. like other people I did people a whole bunch now. of work. Yes. Yeah. And these two senior ladies were like, oh, we can't like deal with this. Could you help us? And you, you can be a representative to people abating. So I... I tried to email them in. I tried to get somebody in City Hall to respond to uh, date time stamping them. And of course, just also for folks back home, currently in Nashua and, and across the state in a lot of places, our public offices are closed. They're not totally. accessible by the people. No. It's been over a year yeah. that a court in New Hampshire and a judge had the audacity to say that our governor may limit or suspend our fundamental rights. And I'm like, that is un-American and it's definitely un-New Hampshire. Yeah. And, um, and our city hall is really closed because they're renovating. Okay. It's not COVID. Oh. They used COVID money to do a complete redesign wow. and renovation of the city, elevators and all. So we're really closed, not because of COVID. Gotcha. And so I couldn't get my applications taken care of. After five days, I went to City Hall. City Hall claims you have to have an appointment. I went in twice to the girl who's the gatekeeper and said, here's what I want. I want to go to the director's office and see if I can get these date time stamped. Is it okay if I do that? Sure. They mm -hmm. had no problem okay. because that office didn't require an appointment. Turns out at 9.30 in the morning, nobody's in working. <laughs> so I go up to the mayor's office. Lights off, nobody's in working. I'm looking for somebody with a date time stamp machine. I went up to the legal office, and that's where my trouble was. Oh. I went in and I said, well, could you date time stamp these? And they said, you have to leave your trespassing. Trespassing and, okay. in a public building. Because, and because I was asked to leave and I didn't, I said, no, I'm going to peacefully stay here until you stamp my things. <laughs> go, Lori! Okay, that was, that was a violation of the law. 
Um, that was criminal trespassing because I didn't leave and I was told to leave. Okay. And the police came. I was totally peaceful. They wrote up a report. They said this woman was totally peaceful, compliant, not difficult, and they gave me a warning. Okay. 28 days later, they arrested me. So did they actually issue a warrant and send that to your lawyer? Or yes. what was that process? So Rick Lehman okay. got the warrant. And actually, they told me, the, the police report said no action was going to be taken. I was just given a warning, no action to be taken. Right. And then 28 days later, I was arrested. And the police position is, the city legal office made us do it. And that is where you get into how do the police work independently. Right. So, so I mean, I know in my lawsuit, when I countersued to the original claim of, you know, wiretapping, disobeying an officer and all of that, I filed the original suit was not, uh, 39 claims of violations of my civil rights. Yeah. Ha are you considering something like that? for? And, and basically, <clears throat> I sued them for retaliatory um, I know Rick is looking into that. Okay. Rick is. I mean, he's so buried with my right to know. He just sort of expanded his office and he became <laughs> Lehman uh, Major List. So it's oh, three wow. of them now. Maybe I could get a job there. So, yeah. <laughs> so he is, you know, uh, but he is up to his eyeballs. My right to know has 10 claims in it. Wow. And it's scheduled to go into court in September. Okay. So I was going to ask a that. A three-day hearing. So, yes, I mean... I'm going to look at it and, you know, another woman was arrested. The whole thing is kind of messy down there. So, so Nashua, it's kind of a test water, I think, at this stage for me. You know, there's a lot of bad things happening in Nashua. We can tell it's retaliatory. The balance, I think, between the state and the citizen is is not in a healthy balance. Not at all. Um, the police are being used as an armed arm of the state to threaten and intimidate people who are literally just trying to follow the law yes. to see what is going on so that we can hold people accountable. So if you can't hold your government accountable and they're arresting the people who are trying, <clears throat> yes. that is a troubling time and a troubling situation Very in much so. America. Yes. So we're going to run out of time here. I I think we might, if we can, just keep going for like 15 minutes on, on Facebook Live over there. But uh, Tammy will be back uh, again with me next week, I believe. Uh, maybe we can have Lori back on the show again Definitely at some Definitely, we'll do it stage. again. It's a lot of fun. Um, everyone, of course, get my check out my book, This Ecstatic Pessimist, on Amazon and on my website, carlagarrick.com. Uh, if you're out there, start enjoying the spring weather, and we will see you back here next week. Take care.